Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 211 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined from across the pond by Ian McPherson. He's the owner of the Edinburgh Cocktail Joint's Panda and Sons and Hoot the Redeemer, the former of which was honored as a 2020 member of the world's 50 best bars. Now, a lot of bars get recognized on this list for their exquisite service, lavish ingredients, whimsical concepts, and intoxicating atmospheres. But aside from checking all those boxes, Ian and his team are raising the stakes by exploring a high-tech rendition of an age-old booze modification technique. This freeze-thaw spirit-jacking method, which is the focal point of our conversation, is called switching or switch finishing, and many of the world's top mixologists are obsessing over this process the same way they did with milk clarification and fat washing a decade ago or more. But before we explain why switching is the next exciting frontier in the professional and home bar world, let's take a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is Princess Mary's Pride. To make it, you'll need two ounces of Calvados or Applejack, one ounce of Dubonnet Rouge, Campari, or some other bitter red aperitif, and one ounce of dry vermouth. Combine all these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, give them a good hard shake, and yes, this is a shaken cocktail with no citrus, then strain into a stemmed cocktail glass and enjoy. The Princess Mary's Pride cocktail was invented on February 28th, 1922 by Harry Craddock, author of the Savoy Cocktail Book, to mark the wedding celebrations of Her Royal Highness Princess Mary. Depending on where you stand, this cocktail could be described as a riff on either a perfect Manhattan or an old pal. Again, depending on the bitterness, sugar, and alcohol content of the aperitif you select. Go more towards the sweet and bitter with Campari and you're kind of looking at more of an old pal riff. And if you're going sort of in a lighter, whinier, kind of vermouth adjacent direction with the Dubinette, then you're looking at more of a perfect Manhattan riff. Now, why was this cocktail shaken rather than stirred? Well, if I had to guess, it's to tone down the highly aromatized ingredients. There's two of them, right? Two vermouths slash aperitivi and to add a little bit more dilution, which made this cocktail an appropriate and quickly batched choice for what must have been an extremely large wedding reception. I'm sure at the time, the royal family sourced some exquisite Calvados from across the English Channel, but if you're here in the US, I'd recommend picking up a bottle of Laird's Applejack to use in this cocktail, which is a slightly darker and more robust take on apple brandy. And of course, it's no coincidence that Applejack was first made using a primitive version of the freeze-thaw technique that we'll be covering with Ian in just a few minutes. So, now that you're equipped with a cocktail that was invented almost exactly one century before the date we're recording this podcast, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this fascinating deep dive with bartender and ice cream fanatic Ian McPherson, some of the topics we discuss include how a childhood love of frozen treats, a fascination with lucid dreaming, and a stint at Italy's most hallowed gelato university led Ian to explore the largely untapped universe of freeze concentration. Why this process, first pioneered by German icebox makers, has affectionately and efficiently come to be known as switching. Then, we break down the process, including how to use switching to modify both ferments and distillates, what tools you'll need, and some of the experiments that have yielded the most interesting results at Ian's bars. 
We also cover why switching produces more pure flavors than heat and pressure intensive techniques that employ traditional stills or rotovaps. A few important precautions to keep you and your guests safe when making and enjoying switch finished products. What the future holds for freeze thaw mixology and much, much more. My biggest takeaway from this conversation with Ian is how wide open this space truly is. As we discuss in the interview, you can literally be the first person in the world to pioneer a switched rendition of your favorite cocktail. Freeze concentration is still in its infancy, and the barriers to entry are extremely low when compared to other techniques in the molecular mixology space, which is exactly why our great-great-great-grandparents were using it to make boozy winter beers and concentrated ciders. With that, please enjoy this Sub-Zero conversation with switch finishing pioneer and award-winning bar owner, Ian McPherson. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure to be here. So let's kick this off by just having you briefly introduce yourself to our listeners. Who are you? What do you do? And what are we here to talk about today? Hi, everyone. My name's Ian McPherson, or known as Yanda or Panda to many of my close friends. I'm based here in Edinburgh, Scotland. I've got um, bars like Panda and Sons and the World's 50 Best, Bargold Hoot the Redeemer, another bar called Nauticus, um, and I'm also an avid uh, researcher and explorer into uh, switching and uh, frozen delights. Yes, indeed. Uh, you are a busy, busy man. How did you get the nickname Panda? Well, it's kind of weirdly about my background. So my dad's from Scotland and my mom's from South Korea. And I think the kind of Asian influence of being kind of pandas and also quite like a, I guess, a easily approachable person kind of fitted that animal. All my friends had different animals associated to them as well. So yeah, I just kind of stuck from, from school. Awesome. Awesome. Well, congrats on the, uh, on the accolades for Panda and Sons. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to dig in here as we kind of explore this innovative technique called switching and uh, see why that bar uh, has gotten so much justifiable acclaim. Uh, but I want to thank someone before we get too far into the meat of the episode here. That person being a former guest and friend of the podcast, Aaron Goldfarb, who put us in touch with one another. He wrote a wonderful article. I believe it was for Punch on the technique that we're here to discuss today, switching. So uh, thanks to Aaron for making that connection. And we will certainly be linking to Aaron's article over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. So if you'd like to check out the article that kicked off this interview, we'll have it for you there. Uh, but Ian, uh, tell me about ice cream because it seems like the roots of switching are in your love for and fascination with all things frozen and delicious. So talk to me about ice cream. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I was very fortunate to kind of be brought up in a lot of Asian countries. So like Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, just kind of following where my dad's work was. But for a large part of his earlier career, when I was smaller, he was in the ice cream industry. So from a very young age, you know, I was very blessed with having a lot of ice cream brought home every day. So you know, I was always very into anything frozen and sweet. And then when it came to our second bar, Hoot the Redeemer, I started designing this bar based on lucid dreams, which sounds pretty weird, but one of my friends was like, you know, you can train yourself into that time when you kind of wake up and you know, when you fall back asleep, you kind of have this really like strong image of your dreams. And if you can kind of train yourself to write them down, you can get some really good ideas. So I did this, kind of trained myself to do that. And yeah, and then a lot of it didn't make sense. A lot of it's absolute rubbish because your brain works in weird ways. Um, but then there was one where it was kind of basically a fun fair for adults. So basically I was in this dream where, you know, it's kind of like the Tom Hanks film Big with that big kind of fortune teller machine. Ice creams were there, but boozy. Um, you know, you had slushy machines that had alcohol in them, 
claw crane machines. And it was just really fun experience. And then when I read that, I kind of kind of kickstarted my or re- reignited my obsession with ice creams. So I really wanted to incorporate that around the whole USP of the bar. So first of all, I did the science of ice cream uh, university degree and the University of Reading down in England. And then once I satisfied that to really understand the more science side of things, um, I really wanted to understand the difference between what makes an ice cream and what makes a gelato. So I actually flew all the way over to Bologna in Italy to attend the Carpegiani Gelato University. And I did um, a variety of their courses there, which was really, really um, amazing experience. And I learned so much. And I've also been a member of the Ice Cream Alliance, the ICA, since 2015. So that's kind of my background in ice creams. I love that there's something called the Ice Cream Alliance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, too. yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful. It, what you're describing reminds me of a conversation that I recently had with another fellow UKer, Ian Burrell from Equiano Rum, and he was telling the story of how he used money that he had set aside as the down payment on a house for his first rum event in the UK. And uh, the joke was like, yeah, you're not a real rum ambassador unless you're putting your down payment on the line for rum. And it seems like you are not a true bartender obsessed until you are willing to get two degrees in ice cream, fly over to another country for one of them in the effort to make this boozy, lucid dream come true. So in that respect, uh, a lot of effort has gone into this. And for anyone who's not super familiar with the ice cream world, Carpegiani, as I understand it, is sort of like the titan of the industry. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. I guess in Italian's mind, it's kind of like the, the Ferraris of the, the ice cream manufacturing world. Indeed, indeed. Well... I'm so happy that you mentioned the lucid dreaming because I think that that's a great entry point into this idea of switching, which is on the surface, and I'll have you define it here in just a moment. On the surface, it is a somewhat obvious thing, right? That was even in Aaron's article, uh, that sort of that feedback of like, oh my God, this is so obvious. How had no one really come up with this yet? But it's a process that I'm assuming requires a decent amount of equipment and some real technical know-how. So why don't you walk us through um, how you develop the idea for switching? And maybe I'll just throw one word out there as a prompt, and that word is Lego. (laughs) Yeah, cool. Um, Yeah, so again, just talking about it, I've always been obsessed with not just ice creams, just anything frozen, you know, obviously you've got block ice, you know, cold weather from Scotland, for example. But um, but for me, with anything to do with cocktails, you know, if I read about a technique to make beer or wine or even just a chefing technique, I, I will practice it so I understand it, follow, you know, certain recipes to do that. And there was one um, basically called Ice Bock, and this is a very uh, primitive style of beer, very delicious, but comes from Germany where, again, it was an accidental technique, but basically they left the beer out in the cold winter months and it froze using the process of freeze concentration. So a large part of the water that makes up beer was frozen, and what they did was they siphoned that off and they were left with um, you know, more concentrated, higher ABV um, beer. I guess like Apple Jack, like Jacking in the States as well, um, same process. Um, and so I was like, cool, I'm going to try this out. And again, like like Lego, I like dismantling things so I can really understand the building blocks of what makes what whatever it is. Um, so I did this just to understand the technique. And, you know, what I was finding was when I was tasting the frozen water, or large parts of it as water, was there was a lot of flavor there. You know, you know obviously when you hear about frozen water, you just think water, but... When I was trying it, I was like, oh, hang on, there's a lot of flavor 
being taken out of, of, of during this process. So then I was thinking about it, you know, I guess in terms of Lego, like, well, then what if I add a different block in? So I guess this is where the name comes from, switching out the frozen element and adding a different um, building block in. Um, and this is kind of where switching became. So I was like, well, if I can take flavors out of the um, ingredients, I can add different flavors in. And yeah, this is really where switching uh, was born. And, you know, a lot of people would get to me going, yeah, this is freeze distillation. I know it's a bigger gray area over in, in the States, but, you know, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, you know, it states that, you know, distilling is about boiling water, you know, to do this. And the difference is when you when you cook something, it's changing the flavor by heat. But when you're freezing something, you're just concentrating the existing flavors that are there. You're not, you're not changing them. You're just concentrating the flavors so um this was kind of the catalyst i guess to really take on board sub-zero um as a complete category and taking it forward this was very helpful for me because what seems like a very simple concept right this freeze distillation so to speak where like on the surface what you're doing is you're taking water out of something it seems like as you were doing some experiments with this, the key to me in what you're saying is that you realize there was still flavor left behind, so to speak, in the water that you were removing. And there's a couple things that are really interesting about that to me, because I think everybody tends to focus in this process on the fact that you are concentrating one thing, but what you chose to focus on is that, oh, but I'm actually removing a little bit of flavor. So what's the opportunity there? So to me, the real dynamic thing about switching, of course, is the question, well, what do we now get to add in to replace the flavor that we took out? And then secondarily, it seems like there might be opportunities to use that water, that sort of lightly flavored or essenced water that was removed for other applications on the side. So do, like in, in a manner of speaking, are you kind of creating, taking one product behind the bar and making two entirely new products out of it? Does that make any sense? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I think also the reason why some people are apprehensive of switching maybe is A, it's something new, but I think B, they associate this technique with um, stuff like a centrifuge, you know, a rotor vap where they think really expensive, delicate um, equipment, but it's not necessarily the case with switching. But yes, you, you are completely right. So we're taking um, the frozen element out that has the flavor, switching a new flavor in to really change the building blocks of what that spirit or whatever you want to switch with is from the beginning and it's completely changed. But yes, so the water element part we found, especially with spirits, we were being left with about 20% um, alcohol. So it was that 40 proof out there. So what we're trying to develop right now is a complete closed loop program. So A, we're getting a nice switched spirit, but then also what we're doing now is we're developing a complete kind of, you know, highball side menu which has been created from the element that we've taken out from the spirit. So we do add a bit more dilution to it to bring it down to a bit more like 10% um, ABV. But yeah, what we're trying to do now is create it so we're not losing anything. All we're doing is we are creating two new products from the one. Um, but right now we're just finalizing our research to make sure it's completely safe because, you know, there's different alcohols that freeze and, and you know evaporate at different temperatures so we're just making sure that what we're taking out you know just the dangerous the more dangerous alcohols that we're taking out of there so yeah we're 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 confident it can be can be completely completely fine but yeah we're just in the final checks now from what we're taking out is still safe to drink mm. Yeah, safety does seem to be important obviously it's important with distillation where you're using intense heat are there any safety concerns with switching? Uh, and here I'm primarily, I guess, referring to 
people potentially going out and trying to use liquid nitrogen to mm -hmm. uh, achieve extremely low temperatures. Uh, are there any, before, before we move on to some of the specific examples of uh, spirits and cocktails that you've created to somehow employing this technique, is, is there any safety related stuff that you want to get out there as sort of like a, just a cover your own back type of situation? Sure. I mean, the, the rule of thumb for us, and I'm not saying you have to always stick by it, but we always switch back in new flavors that are non-alcoholic. So, you know, we, we don't want to add more alcohol into the the switching process. So, yeah, so that, that that's one thing we always do just to kind of be safe. Yeah, I mean, liquid nitrogen is very dangerous because obviously you've got, well, can be very dangerous if you're not trained because of the super cold temperatures. But with, with our freezers, they go down to... Um, minus 45 degrees centigrade. I'm not sure where that is in Fahrenheit, but, you know, for example, you can get freeze burns on your hands. So always wear well-insulated gloves when you're, you know, removing the the liquid out in whatever container it is in. And also just don't drink it immediately because you know, even though it's not as cold as liquid nitrogen, you know, even though it's still liquid, looks like it's liquid, you're, you'd be basically drinking something that's minus 45. So if you want to try it, just, just kind of, give it time to kind of reach room temperature before for doing so. Yes, that's it. It sounds incredibly unpleasant to have what sounds like it would be the equivalent of frostbite mm -hmm. on one's tongue. So uh, yeah. very good advice there. Um, I definitely want to get into the technical components of executing this process uh, so that we can make some recommendations for folks who may want to try their hand at this technique, either in a professional setting or in an at-home setting. But before we do that, uh, can you walk us through some of the specific spirits that you've switched and like essentially the experiments that you've run and the findings that you achieved with those experiments uh, in terms of flavor? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've done pretty much all your kind of major categories, you know, gin, vodka, rum, tequila, mezcal, scotch, bourbon. Um, the, the one things I've found was, you know, when, you, when you're talking about the kind of the gray category of what is rum, you know, or like, do they add sugar or should they not add sugar? Well, for us, that, that's always been the hardest one to use when you're talking about spirits because, you know, we're basing our freezing temperatures based on the alcohol but when you add sugar into the mix you know um a sh sugar is an, like basically an antifreeze so then that that completely alters you know you have to lower the freezing temperature even more so with that we found it a bit tricky and it's quite funny because you have a lot of you know brands stating that we don't add any sugar but you know when we're doing our research you're like well you quite clearly are adding sugar because this would be freezing at this temperature if there was no sugar in here. But yeah, in terms of what we've done with switching so far, we've done loads of things. You know, we can emphasize existing flavors. So we've got our switch Negroni, you know, and so what we did here was we wanted to emphasize the botanicals and the gin. So we took the, you know, large part of the water, a bit of the alcohol out, and we really emphasized the kind of the citrus peels in there. So added a kind of like a clarified orange, lemon, and grapefruit blend in there to kind of really bring out those fruity citrus notes. Um, other ones we've done, which is quite cool, is, you know, for example, there's a, you know, whiskey that's, um, you know, aged in IPA beer barrels, for example. So what we did here is like, well, cool, why don't we take the water out and add non-alcoholic IPA in there? And then suddenly we've got this whiskey that's a double IPA, which we've kind of coined it which is which is really cool so you can play around with all these kind of existing finishes in it and then why not emphasize them more another thing we focused on is texture so for example you know we've got a switched coconut daiquiri on the menu in panda and sun so here we've taken out the water and kind of using i guess a clarifying method of like a milk punch method we've added coconut milk in so you're getting this nice coconut flavor but also a really nice creamy texture to the cocktail as well switch finishing we've done really kind of frankenstein stuff you know where like we want to you know we've got a scotch for example but we're like why don't we take the water element out of a mezcal and add that in there so then we're getting this smoky scotch 
but the smokiness is coming from the mezcal, which is quite cool, and it's giving it a different kind of smokiness because it's not peat, you know, it's a different smoke altogether. So we've been doing that as well. And so, yeah, the, this is kind of the stuff we've done is emphasize existing flavors, really kind of boost finishes and scotch and texture. And yeah, and just do like kind of cross swapping of waters from different spirits. And of course, this is where the Lego analogy really kicks in, right? You're basically taking one building block aspect. The Let's say you've got the Lego head and let's say you're taking the Lego policeman head and you're putting the Lego fireman head on there or something. Yeah. And you're creating a, another another way of saying this would be like you're almost creating these uh uh, chimeras, these uh, these beasts that are you know part one animal, part another animal, uh, or maybe you know you're you're giving an animal with one head kind of two heads in the story about about the different smoke profiles or the different citrus profiles. So uh, you also mentioned you know Frankenstein approach, and I, I think all of that is so on point when discussing this technique, because to me, the primary opportunity here with switching is to take something familiar and emphasize something that is either already there or throw in something that is not present. Like in the, in the coconut milk example with the, uh, with the daiquiri, uh, to me, the experience of drinking a daiquiri is one of lightness. It's tangy it's refreshing it's there but it's almost not there it's so refreshing mm -hmm. and by adding something so texturally rich and flavorful as coconut milk you're almost completely remixing the experience of drinking a daiquiri while still keeping the format at the same abv uh, so I, I don't know T to me it, like that experience of making it a little bit uncanny seems to be important. Would you agree? I 100% agree. And, you know, one thing I love so much about the Lego analogies is I, I've been obsessed with Lego for so long. So having something like a technique I've created and actually explaining it with Lego makes sense. Like it just makes me really, really happy. Oh, there's one more thing as well. So another one we found was, you know, like really like really loads of juice kind of drinks, so like tropical style drinks, for example, like a, I don't know, a jungle bird, for example, with switching, so rather than making a really long drink, we can take the water out of, say, the, the, the rum, and then we're adding the clarified pineapple juice and, and lime juice into the mix. Um, and then basically, instead of making a long drink, we're making a very much a kind of stirred down, you know, and boozy, kind of old fashioned style cocktail, but it's still got all the same ingredients of the Jungle Bird, but we've just using the kind of building blocks of Lego making it a lot more of a kind of, I guess, more of a serious drink, as some people might describe it. Um, but yeah, but you, you can achieve that now with switching, which is exciting also. Yeah, and and to me, you know, there's there are certainly purists out there who would balk at the notion of having a stirred drink with citrus in it. But to me, the clarification completely solves that. And uh, personally, I would be very interested in trying that because when you when you said, um, you know, drinks that contain multiple juices, the first thing that came to mind was a jungle bird. So I think that's a really great application. And again, just sort of turning something on its head, taking a long drink and making it a short drink. To, to me, it comes at a good time because we're emerging from this pandemic. During the pandemic, people went back to a lot of their, you know, sort of old standbys, their comfort drinks. And I think now is a great time to be talking about switching because as we come out of the pandemic, I know a lot of bartenders and bar programs who are looking for fresh ideas, looking for ways to get people to come back. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to emphasize this here on the podcast is because this is this is very achievable. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the rig that you use to accomplish this and maybe throw out, even in euros, I, I'm happy to do the um, translation to dollars uh, for the show notes page, but the, the, the approximate cost of doing certain things with certain pieces of equipment, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so one thing that's pretty cool is we, we use a, a brand of freezer called Tef Cold, and they've got um, a range in the ultra low. So that goes down to, I think, minus 45 centigrade 
Um, but yeah, the, the thing is, it's in a nutshell, it is basically a chest freezer, but it's got the biggest differences between that and a normal commercial chest freezer is it's got thicker insulation and a stronger compressor, which allows it to get colder. But the cool thing about it is it's a it's low energy cost um, because it is a chest freezer and you can still use it like a freezer. So even though you've got your, you know, cool boxes in there with, um, you know, your trials or your batches to make switched cocktails, you can still use it to, you know, keep store your block ice or store any frozen ingredients you want to keep in there. So I think a lot of people will come to you like, oh, we don't have the space. But I'm like, no, no, it's okay. If you're willing to just, just sub out your existing chest freezer and put this one in, and then you can still utilize it as the chest freezer like before, but now you're now opening up the opportunity to allow to have switching on your menu. So, the, you know, for, for a pretty large standard sized one of these, it's um, 800 pounds. So I don't know, well, that's probably like 1100, 1200 bucks, I think. For one of sure in that these. ballpark yeah and then and then the, the, that's the main thing you need obviously but then we like to use cool boxes in there just like you know a lot of people that make homemade uh, block ice just to kind of encourage the directional freezing um so we get the more freezing on the top um so we can siphon off and apart from that you just need like kind of like a chinois to filter out the liquid from the frozen elements of it yeah and just and just I guess a thermometer. Um, if but then that, that apart from that, that's really aside from what you already have in your bar. That that's really the kind of only things you need to have. And the great thing I always tell people about switching compared to some other great techniques, like as I said before, like centrifuge or rotvap. You know, the yield is very small um, unless you're willing to spend tens of thousands of pounds and getting a really big centrifuge. But again, is, is that cost efficient? But here with our freezer we're putting we're doing like 20 30 liter batches at a time and the good thing is not time critical if you if you it usually takes about 36 hours to be ready to kind of take out and do the kind of filtering process but you know it doesn't matter if you miss that by a day you, you can, switching works around your time schedule you don't have to be a slave to the technique um, and keep checking on it. So it is once you've done it once, you realize actually it's a very straightforward process. It's not time consuming. It's not wasting a lot of energy. And yeah, you, you can even, if you have one bigger bar and you've got a few, you can probably supply the rest of the bars just using the one freezer as well. That is absolutely brilliant because obviously money is tight. I mean, Money's always tight when running a bar or a mm -hmm. restaurant. It's just that kind of business. But especially these days, uh, I would not be envious of anyone who is trying to open a, a bar right now. But what I love about everything you just communicated is it seems like it's the expense is, you know, what maybe, you know, even if we go to the high end of that range and, and assume that, you know, one of these freezers in the US is going to be twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, like there's so much upside in what you just described it. You can just literally swap out your current freezer, maybe sell that for a couple hundred mm -hmm. and recoup some of the expense. You can use it for everything that you've been using it for, plus the switching and uh, the directional freezing that you were just describing. And like if I if I had to pitch this to an investor or a bar owner, I mean, it just it it seems like adding one or two dollars uh, or pounds in your case to a drink on the menu justifiably because it's using this really interesting technique and it's probably something that someone's not going to be able to to find at other bars in the area like that will pay for itself so rapidly that it's almost a non-expense so uh, certainly for folks who are trying to do something like this at home obviously there are space constraints i do not have the room for a chest freezer for example but Aside from that, I mean, like even people who are really serious about doing this at home, like there are other uses for a chest freezer, as you mentioned, besides this process. So again, even if this is just a pitch session to a spouse or a roommate, I could see the, a lot of good arguments to be made for this uh, equipment wise. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. 
if you're like me, here are some things you might be like. You live in the mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need near country provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages, and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is the real deal, and I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. That is literally it. We, you need a supercharged chest freezer, a thermometer, a chinois, and some... Uh, what what kind of containers do you use when you're putting the juices and or the spirits and ferments into the freezer? Yeah, just just using a kind of usual kind of, um, you know, cool boxes you take to the park. So just using insulated like Coleman's um, mm-hmm. cool boxes. And yeah, we use ones that are quite small. So like have maybe like a five liter capacity and, and yeah and then they work perfectly fine just to make sure you just take the lid off it and and it works works great and then the good thing about doing it in smaller batches is your batches will obviously freeze and be ready quicker so we, we just do even if we're doing the same cocktail instead of having a large one we'll do like in three small cool boxes just to kind of speed up the process but the good thing about these freezers as well is it doesn't have to be a large one i think the smallest ones are you know, 750 centimeters wide, so less, sorry, 75 centimeters wide, sorry, so uh, less than the meter. So, you know, a lot of them don't have to take up a lot of space. And the cool thing I find really exciting is, you know, as you were saying, you could be the first one in the area doing it, but you could be the first one in the world switching, I, I don't know, like a, a cosmopolitan, you know, like, so it's, it's so, it's still relatively new and that, and it's still not, that many people doing it yet that you, your bar or you as an individual could be the first one to have switched that specific cocktail or if there's an obscure spirit out there you could be the first one to have ever done that so i love that fact that someone out there could be the first person doing something with switching and so this is why i'm so open about it and again just you know i want to see people expand their um repertoire of techniques it feels like you and i are having a conversation like many that must have taken place in the early days of cryptocurrency. It just seems like such a wide open landscape and like there are so many opportunities and the entry fee is so low at this point that it's just inherently so like I'm getting so excited just talking about this and there's no ch- there's no chance that I'm going to be getting a uh, a chest freezer anytime soon unfortunately but I am so absolutely stoked for all of the bar managers who might be listening who are just like ooh that's actually in our budget range we could probably start playing around with this as soon as we're able to get one of these freezers so i guess the last i guess technical follow up that i wanted to ask is about temperature relative to ABV. And the reason why I ask that is because the process that you mentioned earlier, jacking, is pretty much always done, as is icebox, with fermented beverages, which have a higher water to alcohol ratio than spirits do. So when you're thinking about using switching with a ferment versus with a spirit is there any difference with how you treat those or because we're not talking about using heat here because we're talking about using uh freezing and water freezes at 32 fahrenheit zero celsius every time and stays frozen any at any temperature below that you know, with the caveat of being modified by that alcohol and potentially any sugar in there is there any way that you treat ferments differently than spirits when you're putting them into the negative 45 degree C? Yeah, so actually, I'm glad you mentioned that, actually. So if you're doing like just a beer or a wine or a ferment, you you could actually just use your normal freezer. 
because actually because of the ABV, sorry, the freezing temperatures, you know, I don't know, mi minus five or something like this, it, it actually freezes quicker. So what, what we've done is I've got a really good relationship with our um, kind of fridge freezer uh, engineer. And I, I just got him to hack mine because when you buy a commercial freezer, it, it's got set parameters. So it can't go higher than a certain temperature or it's not deemed a safe freezing temperature so what we did is i think it's minus 10 centigrade that it's set up for here in the uk so i asked him if he could just hack our um, control that i can actually bring it down to minus one minus two and that that's the only thing you really need to do is actually hack the thing to break past the safety code built in so you can actually make it warmer um, because what you find is it freezes quicker and the opposite from when I was saying I'm doing small batches to make sure you're catching it before maybe it freezes too much with beer and wine. I find it's a bit trickier. If you're doing a larger batch, it's actually better because then you're able, it's a bit more time time critical actually because of how delicate the how close it is to um, freezing. So yeah, larger batches. If you've got a good relationship with your fridge freezer engineers that you use for your bars, just ask them to bypass the, the the control so you can actually do it going down to minus one etc i think that's a really good point and the way that i form a shorthand for this in my brain is by thinking like okay treat ferments beers wine ciders etc like they are more delicate than spirits in the same way that they are more delicate in terms of the alcohol that they contain. They are also more delicate in terms of the potential if you're using these really supercharged freezing systems to come out with a literal block of beer ice, right? Like there's a certain point at which this just will freeze solid as a ferment. So I think that was uh, probably the most important process point in terms of making some recommendations that people can follow. Because I, I, I do think that in the tradition of jacking, that ferments are a logical place to start for this process. So any last notes on how much time it takes? And I, I, I understand that this all is somewhat contingent on the volume of the batch that you're creating. But you said that the spirits were a little bit less sensitive about timing. But like if I were using my home freezer mm -hmm. to conduct a switching run using a standard beer, maybe in the style of an ice box. Let's say I were trying to recreate an ice box in my own home freezer. Do you have any recommendations for our at-home listeners about how long they might try to do that for and what size batch roughly they might want to start with? Yeah, I'd say for an ice box, you want to do, I'd say just to be safe until you get more comfortable with it um, to do at least a 10 liter batch um, and then a, at least 12 hours and then after that maybe just keep checking it every hour or two but the, the good thing about it is you know it's not failed when you've over froze it all you, all you really need to do is a bit of patience thaw it back out again and then just try again but just um trial and error is very important so you know, don't, don't make drastic changes to what you're doing. Keep track of how long you did it in the previous um, you know, trial, temperature. Maybe you can make it colder and reduce your time. But yeah, uh, trial and error is important. And just don't change more than one thing you're doing at a time. Uh, patience is key. And there's loads of really great free on online websites to calculate percent, um, you know, your freezing points. So there's a website called shotgundentist.com i don't know why it's called that but you can you can you know calculate you can type in this is how much alcohol is in this what's the temperature i need to freeze it in and also from my experiences with freezers especially chest freezers is because they're on a thermostat they're not a constant temperature so for example for us for you know 40 percent abv i think that's minus 13 fahrenheit freezing point so minus 27 centigrade we always do four degrees centigrade 
colder. So for minus 27, we're doing minus 31 because we found we had to make it slightly colder to counteract the fluctuate, slight fluctuation in temperature. So factor that in as well. So you'd have to make it a little bit colder than the exact freezing point for that. And yeah, larger batches if you're doing kind of ferments. And yeah, just, just trial and error, change one thing at a time and just have a bit of patience with it. That is such, such good advice on all fronts. Uh, I couldn't agree with it more. And as much as it pains me to say, we will be linking to shotgundentist.com <laughs> over on the uh, show notes page. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't get me on any uh, government watch lists. But um, yeah, that's that's all great resources. And we'll be sure to uh, we'll, we'll put together a quick little guide with some bullet points that summarize some of the advice that you've just given, uh, including, you know, the technical specs, the, um, I believe it's called the, the Tef Cold Ultra Low Chest Freezer. We'll have all of that on the show notes page. So uh, don't worry about trying to frantically take notes if you're listening to this uh, at the office or on your commute. But I guess I wanted to wrap up our conversation about switching, switch finishing, about what the future looks like. It seems like based on what we were speaking about earlier, the frontier is wide open. But are there any uh, certain projects or ingredients that you're particularly excited about in the immediate future for you? And uh, I guess maybe what do you think this trend is going to look like long term a few years down the road? Sure. Um, yeah, so... So switching is exciting. Um, you know, I chat to a lot of great people about it. So, you know, at the moment, I think 20% of the world's 50 best have used it or are currently using this technique. In terms of future projects, I'm working with a brand to do a roadshow next year where we're going to do a fully immersive experience. So not just about taste and smell, but everything, every single sense will be immersed in this kind of switching um workshop so we're developing that right now hopefully to roll that roadshow out in march so i'm really excited about that part but for me it's about switching is just for me the catalyst of my whole long-term plan i'm going to keep doing more and more developments of switching but for me it's about um sub-zero temperatures as a whole big category so you know we've learned so many great things from top chefs, you know, Michelin star restaurants, you know, about cooking techniques. So this is all involving, um, you know, mostly heat. But, you know, with Sub-Zero, we're not cooking the flavors. We are, we are capturing the freshness and we are achieving similar goals, but in a completely different way and really kind of keeping the flavors. So, for example, we have switching. Another thing I've been working a lot on is with freeze drying. So with freeze drying, for example, You've got to think about, you know, a dehydrator heat. It gets rid of all moisture. And then you've got, you know, garnishes or, you know, ingredients. But with a freeze dryer, we use the process of sublimation where you're freezing it very cold. It slowly heats it. And with a vacuum a chamber pump, you're extracting the moisture and you're left with, again, an ingredient with no moisture. But but it's not changed its flavor. You've just concentrated it. And with freeze drying, you can rehydrate it pretty much near back to its original state, which is mind blowing for me. And we're doing a lot more Frankenstein stuff of this. And for me, I'm just trying to really get the, you know, the bar industry excited about, we can now start developing our own techniques and with Sub-Zero and really kind of corner that as our own thing and how cool would that be if we've got Michelin star restaurants and the top chefs taking ideas from us and bringing them to the kitchen? So this is what I'm trying to do. Is like we've we've learned some really cool things from kitchens, maybe slightly a bit too reliant on what they're doing. Let's flip it on its side and start just creating our own things. And th this is what I'm really trying to um, encourage with Sub Zero. Yeah. And you are a tremendous advocate for it. I, I love the passion 
in your voice as you took us through those ambitious goals for uh, kind of flipping things on their head, as as you say, and having the uh, having the chefs come to uh, to the bar folks for their next little shot of inspiration. So I love that. Uh, are you able to share any of the potential locations for this road trip? Are you going to be primarily staying in Europe, in the UK, or are there any plans to maybe have a branch of that include uh, the US or other parts of the globe? Um, yeah, so we'll be starting this in Germany with a with the Scottish brands, and hopefully, if it is a success, I think this is very much the the test market for it. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully, we can go to the states. I think um, I need uh, a legal team to just make sure what I'm doing is okay to do over in the states, because I think there's a big gray area in terms of what you can and can't do, more so in the states. So. Hopefully, if this goes well with this brand, then we can maybe have a budget to kind of clarify a few question marks. And then, yeah, I'd, I would love to do this this roadshow in the States and the rest of the world. Yes. Uh, I think that's an important caveat that we should probably throw out there. Uh, we've been speaking about a pretty new process. And the way that regulation works here in the States is that... Uh, you know, it, it, regulation generally comes on the back end of something that is new and innovative. Rarely does our regulation predict new and exciting things. Uh, we're not that good, and neither uh, are the legislators, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, please do uh, check with the legislation in your area. If you are listening to this in any state in the U.S., your state has different liquor laws and bar laws than the states that surround you. So please do make sure that this process that we're describing doesn't fall under some statute that would put you afoul of the law. And that's about as much as I can say about that. Maybe we'll stick a, a quick little disclaimer at the beginning of this episode, but it does strike me that there are states where you can't do things like create your own house infusions, for example, if you like uh, infuse spirits. So if you're in a place where you can't infuse spirits, maybe this switching technique might put you in that space where you're maybe not supposed to be doing that either. I don't like that sort of regulation. I think it's not super helpful, but it is the reality for many bartenders and bar programs here in the US. So please do your homework, not only on the technical ways to achieve this technique, but also on the legality of it, just for your own sake. Um, so Ian, is there anything else that we have forgotten to mention or that you would like to communicate to our listeners before we jump into a quick lightning round here? Yeah, I, I guess plant the seed and following up from you said, obviously do your research. But you know, if, if you've got like, like states that are very encouraging micro distillers now, Maybe you can collaborate and do it on their site. I don't know if that would help. And then that would be quite cool they're using their brand. So I don't, I don't know if there's a collaborative way of making that work in your respective states. Um, so, yeah, again, do your research, but maybe that could be a, a potential way of allowing you guys to start practicing the technique. Right. And uh, I feel like with the expense of distilling equipment, uh, you know, if, if you were able to collaborate with a distiller and uh, maybe split the cost of that, uh, that really intense uh, freezer, then I could see a great collaboration coming out of that. And I mean, it, it's a bit of an oddball idea, but I actually really like it. I think it could be a very, um, very sort of elegant solution yeah, to some of those legislative problems. So that, yeah, very good advice, Ian. So with that, let's jump into the lightning round. First question here, I'm going to completely change on you. It was, what is your favorite cocktail? But you're an ice cream guy. You've been an ice cream guy from childhood. So yeah. what is your favorite ice cream? So everywhere I go, I always go to the, what's the most famous gelato place. I always order pistachio ice cream. This to me is the acid test of really how good they are and how good quality ingredients you are because the scale of pistachio and the colors you get is vast. So like usually when it's a bit more of a kind of dull kind of avocado, slight touch of brown color to it, then I know they've got, they're definitely using real pistachio. And I love pistachio as well, but that's the first ice cream I try in a new gelato shop or ice cream shop and just to kind of, 
as a test to see their true quality. That's amazing. We talk about indicator cocktails all the time on this podcast where you go to a bar and you order that one cocktail just to test out their program. So I love that you have an ice cream slash gelato correlative to that. <laughs> and uh, besides the the coloration being kind of closer to that avocado with a, a hint of brown in it, is there any other quality indicator that you look for in a great pistachio gelato? Sure. Um, so also the amount of stabilizers you use. So like, you know, when you see like a tower of ice cream in the, in the fridge, th that's not normal. So for me, it's about making sure they're not overcompensating with other kind of powders and stuff to make it look better. Um, and if it's too shiny, another kind of red flag for me. So, but yeah, but you want it to be firm and it's not melting immediately. So there's a fine balance between being overstabilized and perfect. So for me, it's, yeah, it's about the texture is another um, kind of indicator for me as well. Mm, spoken yeah. like a true ice cream nerd. <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, watch out for those stabilizers, people. They can be used and then they can be overused like yeah. so many things. Uh, next question. Do you have any small or idiosyncratic occurrences or events that uh, always just make your day, something that's unique to you. Yeah, so actually going back to Hoot the Redeemer, the bar I built on um, Lucid Dreams was, the way I developed this, I wanted to touch on people's childhood memories, because like for me, being in a, in a fun fair, I had loads of really fun, amazing memories that I've not necessarily thought of for years. Kind of reminds me of like that stepbrothers scene near the end when the two brothers just have all these flashbacks so you get, I want this kind of experience when people walk in and go, wow. But then also the other side of that, you know, you have the opposite effect where sometimes people have bad experiences at fun fairs when they're children or they might have a phobia of clowns. So it's not that I enjoy it, but it's fascinating to see, you know, majority of people have that positive effect going to Hoot the Redeemer, but you get this minority that have this flashback of a negative childhood, like, clown trauma or something like that that happens sometimes so i guess i hope that answers that question yeah it's interesting to uh to see all the different uh, experiences when people walk through the door because what you're evoking with your sort of interpretation of this fun fair is very unique to them so they're bringing this like a set of very specific experiences into your bar yeah. and then you get to see the reaction of that person's very unique experience pass through your interpretation of the concept so i can see how that would be very entertaining certainly yeah next question if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world past or present who would it be where would you go what would you drink just paint us a picture so it would have to be for um my old friend Gary Regan, who's sadly passed away, but it would be in an old Scottish pub just drinking a really lovely pint of ale or, or lager. Because when I was a really up and coming bartender, I was in this um, global competition. It was the first time I was like, representing Scotland or the UK in a competition. And, you know, you meet a lot of brand ambassadors who are very professional in their job, but they meet a million people, um, you know, and you know, sometimes you have people that are very arrogant that are very high up, which is, you know, natural for some people. But with Gary Regan, he was very humbled. And, you know, you, you just assumed from being on a few trips that, you know, th that's just him being a very professional, polished, you know, um, inspirational leader in our industry. But, you know, he, he kept in touch with me for years after that, you know, like just not spoken to me for a while. Ian, I've got a friend that's in Edinburgh. Can you show him around or you know, oh, Ian, I see you've done this cocktail. Can I add this to my book? So, yeah, he was one of those people that I remember just being very genuine. And it, it just reiterated to me that you can be someone of massive influence and you don't have to be a dick. You can actually be a really nice, sincere, caring, and genuine person. And to me, that sort of embodiment of a hospitality is what really makes Gaz stand out as, you know, one of the titans of the cocktail revival. So, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing that story with us because he is obviously a huge figure uh, in a huge absence now. Mm -hmm. Did did he ever um, stick his finger in a Negroni that you had? Um, every single time. I think, I think just any drink actually, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he did. He did a lot and a lot of fun memories of the, the late Gary. Yeah. 
That's that's brilliant. Uh, last question here: Do you have any unusual or controversial views in the beverage space? Yeah. So look, I I think they obviously take away take aside the lockdown aspect, but you know, the whole cocktail side of our industry has been really moving forward at a really fast pace. But I, I call it like the the bartender illness, and it's this um. Psycholo- psych- psychological um, thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where people think they have heightened skill or intellect than they actually really do. And yeah, I, I find that is quite prevalent in our industry. And for me, I'm always trying to encourage people, like, if you don't know something, just ask the question. You know, the more you the more you ask, the more you know, the, you know, the more knowledge you get, the more power you not knowledge is power. So I think what's maybe holding our industry back is too many people with heightened, I guess, feelings of themselves. So yeah, I, I, maybe that's slightly controversial, but that's the way I've seen, you know, a lot of people in our industry that just maybe have slightly inflated ideas of themselves. So I think just, if you don't know something, learn or, or ask. Yes. Spoken extremely well. And, uh, I, I get a sense that on this podcast, we tend not to have a lot of folks like that. I, I, I've had a number of conversations recently where that beginner's mindset is incredibly important. Um, Ryan Christensen from Bar Hill Gin, Caledonia Spirits, immediately comes to mind uh, as a recent interview where we talked heavily about that beginner's mindset. And, you know, like, I think this just brings us full circle to the Legos concept where it's like, ultimately, is switching a really fascinating and generative kind of technique that can bring us to new heights in terms of what we can achieve in the cocktail space. Yeah, it's absolutely really technical and interesting and complicated in its own ways. But at the end of the day, like it's still just taking the head off of one Lego person and putting on the head from another Lego person. And uh, to keep that beginner's mindset and curiosity, I think is, is really uh, going to sort of separate the people who can really take this concept and run with it from the people who will maybe look into it as a passing fancy or lark and then not really be able to execute. So that's my take. That's why I'm so excited about switching and uh, super grateful that you were willing to come on and and walk us through it in the detail that you did. Uh, So Ian, I would love to invite you to share all of the digital ways to connect with you to learn more about switching and of course your fantastic programs uh, where can we find you on the internet and social media sure um best place is probably you know instagram so i'm at the cocktail panda or you can email me at ian at panda and sons dot com um it's probably the best places to to get me i'd say yeah Right. And that's Ian, I-A-I-N. So yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I'm excited, maybe not in my own home to do this because that's just, I think the chest freezer is is just a little bit too much to ask in my my little condo. But I'm excited to um, see more of this. Maybe uh, down the road, if you your travels do take you to the U S uh, I hope that we can maybe set something up in Washington DC because I know that the bar guilds here would absolutely eat this up and you would have a very receptive audience if you did come to DC. So if, if there's any way for you to uh, pencil that into a potential future itinerary, then we'd love to have you. And certainly I think uh, as would tales of the cocktail down in new Orleans. So to the extent that we can make any of that work, I'd love to grab a drink with you. And thanks so much, Ian, for being a guest here on the modern bar cart podcast. Thank you, Eric. It's been a really enjoyable experience. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. 
The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed. Switching insights courtesy of Ian McPherson and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.